Okay, welcome to the What's the Big Idea web edition this month. We held uh, the event uh, for our clients in our offices, and we like to put these on the web to share it with others uh, what we do. Um, so let's, let's start with slide number one. We have posted all these slides out on our website, and uh, we always start with a little overview of who we are and what we do. We are a registered investment advisory firm with the state of Kansas, and we market ourselves based on better research. We, we create custom portfolios of stocks and bonds and select mutual funds and exchange traded funds on behalf of our clients, which are individuals and corporations and uh, uh, trust plans and some 401ks. And to do that, we research the investments that we own, we research the companies that we do business with and try to get to know their management teams and what it is about those companies that uh, gives them a greater likelihood of success in the future. And um, that's where our passion is and that's what we love to do. So we uh, put on events like this so we can showcase how that uh, plays out in the management of our portfolios. We practice a golden rule investing approach, which is just another way of saying that we're invested alongside our clients. That is an integrity thing for us. Uh, we think that it should be the norm in this industry, but uh, it, it isn't always the case, so uh, we always pause to point that out. We're very conservative in our approach. We practice biblically responsible investing, and we are certified Catholic practitioners, which doesn't make us the moral authority on anything, but it is something we're very proud of. It's a, a step that we take to try to integrate the, the people we are on Sundays with the people we are during the rest of the week, and just trying to live out that life of integrity, and this is one of the ways that we try to do it. Um, for anybody that's interested, we wrote a newsletter back in October of 2010 that went into detail about how our uh, Catholic values are integrated into our investment research process. So that's on our website. You can check that out and learn more about how that affects what we do if you're interested. So moving on to slide number two, the slide deck that we've put out on our website represents the some total of our macro level thinking. There's a lot of slides out there and I won't touch on them all today. I only want to touch on uh, several of the most important and some new data that we try to call every month to add some new insights into our research process. But this slide is a slide that we present every month because more so than anything else, what affects what we do and the decisions we make is debt. And this slide details the total amount of debt outstanding in the United States across all sectors. So government, state, municipal, consumer business now in excess of fifty trillion dollars and when we add entitlements on top of that we get to one hundred trillion dollars in debt that number is uh, incredible and too big to really wrap our our heads around so we have slide number three that shows what happens as we continue to spend three dollars for every two dollars we take in in tax revenues and ultimately that keeps us on a trajectory that takes us past Spain, past Italy, past Greece, past all of the worst offenders in Europe. What we're seeing in Europe now is a preview for what will happen in the United States as the world loses confidence in our ability to pay back our debts if we stay on the trajectory that we're currently on. We don't forecast this. We don't think this is a likely event. But in order to prevent this from happening, we have to correct course. We wrote a a lengthy newsletter for all of our clients last month called The Fiscal Cliff, which you can find on our website that analyzes some of the repercussions from the package of tax increases and spending decreases that has been referred to as the Fiscal Cliff, set to go into effect January 1st of 2013. So check that out. Okay, I will skip down to slide number seven, and I just want to touch on a few of the data points that are covered in this newsletter, which we have also heard referred to as tax them again. This is the, set to be the largest tax increase in history. 82.9% of U.S. households face tax increases averaging $3,700. That data point comes from the Tax Policy Center, a bipartisan institute. Mm, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke has referred to this as um, the fiscal hoof and has said that it poses a significant threat to the recovery of the economy. This could cause a 5% contraction in the U.S. economy and capital gains taxes are set to rise from 15 to 
0.8%. And perhaps most importantly for investors, especially those who are living on investment income in retirement, the tax on dividends is set to rise from 15% to 43.4%. So this could be very meaningful for all, all client, for our clients and all investors. It's something that we're monitoring very closely. We expect for there to be a last minute package of delays and or compromises that would lead, lead to something less impactful. But in lieu of that, it is something we have to be very mindful of. Slide number, slide numbers eight and nine show two new charts that came to our attention this month from Crestmont Research that we found uh, posted to Barry Ritholtz's blog. The first of which shows the history of bull markets over the last hundred years. So these are all overlaid on the same graph beginning at time zero and bull markets run from five to 10 to sometimes 15 years or longer. And it shows the starting P.E. ratio. As a bull market develops, corporate earnings tend to grow. And as corporate earnings tend to grow, other investors tend to become attracted to the market. As other investors are attracted to the market, the amount that they're willing to pay per dollar of earnings expands. So we have first growing earnings and second an expansion in the price to earnings multiple. Both of these forces come together to result in a bull market. And you can see here on this graph that bull markets typically start in a range of five to five to 10 or 12 price to earnings ratio. And they typically end at a price to earnings ratio of between 20 and 25. The outlier on this chart is the bull market that ended in 1999, which uh, exceeded a price to earnings ratio of 45, which was, uh, uh, an outlier going back several hundred years. Uh, so it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the tech bubble. Since then, as, and if we move on to slide number eight there, we have been correcting. And this slide number eight similarly shows the bear markets beginning typically in a price to earnings ratio range of between 20 and 25. And bear markets will last until the market has corrected down to, towards a price to earnings ratio of between 5 and 10. Now it's important to mention here that the denominator in this PE ratio is an earnings number that has been calculated as an average of the last 10 years. This is a method that was first championed by Benjamin Graham and it smooths out the natural cyclicality that's embedded in earnings over um, uh, expansionary and recessionary cycles. So we consider this data to be very meaningful and it's, it, it impacts how we manage our client portfolios and it results in an environment for us where we feel like we have, um, we have just cause to be more patient with our client capital in a market like this. Uh, more patient and more cautious. So we uh, we uh, show these charts to give our uh, clients and others an overall feel for the relative attractiveness and or expensiveness of the market at any point in time. So let me move on and I'm, gonna, I'm skipping through these next charts. If you happen to see something in our deck of charts here that interests you, please reach out to us uh, uh, over the phone or email or via our website and uh, ask us a question or we're happy to engage with you and tell you more about our thinking. Um, before I get on to our big idea of the month, I want to pause on slide number 16 and give you a little bit overview of how we view investment opportunities. And we view them through the lens of the three M's. Our three M's approach stands for management, moat, and mispricing. We look for good management teams, doing business with people of high integrity and management teams that are shareholder friendly is crucial to our process. The longer I'm in this business, the more key this metric has become, the more key pairing our capital with other management teams of, of high integrity becomes um, uh, not, not so much just something we look at for good returns on our clients, but something that we look at to limit our risk. Uh, then we look for a moat. Uh, the concept of a moat harkens back to the Middle Ages. The wider and deeper a castle's moat, the more successful they were at fending off competition. Similarly, the wider and deeper a company's moat, the more successful they will be at fending off 
uh, competition from other business uh, competitors. So, so we look for companies with good moats, and then we look for mispricing. Uh, it's, e it's easy to identify a great company uh, with a with a good moat, but if we don't get it at the right price, then we'll fail in our uh, investing approach. So a company has to have all three. And MFC Industrial does have all three, and I'd like to detail our in investment thesis on MFC Industrial and the process that we went through in evaluating this company. And hopefully you'll see the wisdom in, in our approach. Uh, so let's move on to slide number 18 and uh, we'll do a little business overview. MFC is a merchant bank and global supply chain management company. So they source, deliver, finance, and hedge iron ore, bauxite, manganese ore, cobalt, other base metals, steel, zinc, aluminum, coal, silicon and ferrous alloys, plastic, and wood products. Approximately 30% of their earnings last quarter came from a royalty interest that they hold on the Wabash iron ore mine in Canada that is operated by Cliffs Natural Resources. And that's important because this royalty interest in the iron ore mine will be crucial to our investment thesis, as you'll see uh, this unfold later. MFC also or owns iron ore mines in India, southwest Missouri, metals refining operations in Europe. They own a cobalt mine, hydroelectric power plants in Uganda, global interest in various real estate, oil, natural gas, and other assets. MFC CEO is uh, named Michael J. Smith. He has a very shareholder-friendly track record that uh, we like. Um, MFC has rewarded its shareholders with uh, spin-outs, dividends, returns of capital over the last 10 years that amount to over a 20% annualized rate of return. So the proof is in the pudding. Michael J. Smith has really delivered on behalf of his shareholders in the past, and we think that MFC is, gonna, um, is, is set up so that he can do it again. We have some recent insider buying activity. Michael Smith bought an additional 180,000 shares of MFC at prices near the $7 per share where MFC trades today late last year. So we always like to see a management team that has a little skin in the game and a management team that's putting their own capital to work at prices where our, cl our clients can buy at today. And then lastly on this slide, we note stock buybacks at the management level too. Uh, at the company level, the MFC is taking their cash pile and putting it to work buying back their own shares in the open market. So this is another positive signal that evidences the fact that the management team thinks that the shares are attractively priced at uh, today's price and evidence of some very shareholder friendly activity. Slide number 20 talks a little bit about the moat, and this is predominantly based in MFC's merchant banking business as uh, they engage companies to supply and source commodities across the globe. They naturally develop relationships that um, allow them to build their reputation and become known as a provider of financing when and if other companies should ever find themselves a little bit stretched. And that presents opportunities for a company like MFC over time to take equity stakes at some very attractive prices. So when we pair that with MFC's cash that they have on the balance sheet and Michael J. Smith's in impressive track record over the last 10 years, we become confident in the fact that he'll be able to do it again by exercising the same patience and diligence that have got us to this point. We also note the royalty stream here. We, we key in on the royalty stream because it provides us with some protection in an inflationary environment. We've talked a lot in the past about how we expect our nation, nation's debt level and the other massive debts of countries around the globe, how we expect that situation to play out. We expect higher taxes, we expect lower spending, and increasingly we expect um, we expect the Federal Reserve Banks around the world to print more dollars so that they can pay off these debts with currency units of lesser and lesser value, and that will result in inflation. So given our expectation, we're trying to position our clients' portfolios to both protect their downside and grow in that type of environment. And a royalty stream is really perfect for that because it doesn't. It, it allows our revenues to reprice themselves in an inflationary environment, but it doesn't. Um, it doesn't require the additional capital that most other businesses would. So we're attracted to MFC's royalty stream. 
Well, let's move on to slide number 21, and I'll talk a little bit about the mispricing. Uh, it's first evidenced by the book value. MFC has a book value of $8.92 versus a current price of $7. $4.70 of that per share value is in cash, so there's no discrepancy at all about what that cash might be valued at. Last quarter, well, this is first quarter of 2010, 2012, MFC reported $0.23 cents in earnings per share, and that was depressed due to some weather-related issues and some equipment-related issues at the Wabash Mine. On a full-year basis, we expect them to do around $0.80 cents in earnings per share. When we back out the cash, that amounts to a price-to-earnings ratio of less than 3. So, very cheap as evidenced by just that ratio. We also have global opportunities based on MFC's big cash hoard and Michael Smith's ability to put that cash to work. And in the meantime, while we wait for those opportunities to manifest, MFC is going to pay us a 3.1% uh, dividend yield, so we're attracted to that as well. Moving on to slide number 22, as we analyze this investment opportunity, we drill in a little bit deeper and we take a look at the Wabash only revenues and earnings. And as we look at Wabash and the royalty stream from that Wabash property, property, what we find is that we can create an investment thesis that justifies the purchase of MFC based only on these cash flows. And then anything else that results in positive earnings and cash flows from the other ventures that MFC has as a uh, at, on its balance sheet now. That's all upside for our clients. So we take an ultra-conservative approach and we look at just one business unit, we get ourselves conservative with that, and we find that we have an attractive opportunity in just that, and then all of the other operations are, are upside when, when and if they play out. So let's take a look at Wabash. In the first quarter of 2000 share, 2012, earnings per share from Wabash were 7 cents on production of 482,000 tons. And remember I said earnings from Wabash were depressed in the first quarter due to weather-related issues and equipment-related issues. As those correct themselves, management expects production from the mine of 3.7 million tons for the full year. That's a six-fold increase over the first quarter and should result in earnings per share of around 53 cents from the Wabash royalty interest only assuming steady state pricing. So if we look at the earnings from Wabash only, again back out the cash that MFC has on its balance sheet, we now have a price to earnings ratio of 4.3, still incredibly cheap when we look at only Wabash. And we also note here that Wabash has a 19 year mine life and the contract governing the royalty interest provides for minimum royalty payments of $3.25 million annually, which would equate to a 2.3% yield on only Wabash. So we have some downside protection here that with the uh, minimum payment. Lastly on this slide we note that a uh, recent Barron's article noted that Cliffs trades at six times earnings and the steel industry as a whole trades for eleven and a half times earnings. If we uh, use the range for earnings multiple on the earnings we expect from the Wabash royalty interest there from 6 to 11. We could very reasonably put a price target on uh, MFC's Wabash royalty interest of between $7.88 and $10.79. And here again, remember, we're only looking at Wabash. So MFC trades at $7. We have a conservative price target of between $7.88 and $10 with upside from there as Michael Smith deploys this cash pile and do, continues to do what Michael Smith does. So moving on to slide number 23, let's talk a little bit about what Michael Smith does. Recently MFC made a, a bid for a company called Compton, uh, Compton Petroleum. This is a bid that's outstanding and it's not embedded into our investment thesis yet because it hasn't been approved, but we're monitoring it very closely and it, it looks like it could be a perfect example of why we're interested in, in MFC and why we're interested in doing business with Michael Smith. So as I said, it's a pending acquisition, contingent on approval. Compton is an oil and natural gas producer slash explorer, mostly natural gas, which is key. They have 51 million barrels of oil equivalent approved reserves with annual production of over 13,000 barrels. Compton's book value as of the end of the first quarter was $10.53. The, 
the bid that MFC gave to Compton, the acquisition price, was a dollar twenty-five. So this is a classic example of how a company got themselves in a little bit of trouble. One of the their lines of credit was pulled. They found themselves scrambling for additional financing. Step in Michael Smith and MFC with a lowball offer. Take it or leave it. There, Michael Smith is uh, speaks very often on his conference calls about bids that they might have uh, out in the marketplace, different opportunities that they're they're looking at. They look at a lot of opportunities and many of them don't close. This looks like it has a reasonable likelihood of closing given that the management team has already committed their stake, which is 50% of the 66% of the total shares outstanding, Compton shares outstanding, that have to approve the bid. So it looks like he might have swooped in and really gotten a steal here. Um, as you would expect, this company has some problems. They're uh, reserves being mostly natural gas were re revised downward significantly with the fall in natural gas prices early this, earlier this year. But this may very well be the perfect time to make an acquisition in the space. I uh, reference on slide number 24 a quote from one of my own personal investing uh, uh, mentors, greats, somebody I look up to and hold in a lot of esteem is uh, Jeremy Grantham. Uh, runs Grantham Mayo Van Artelu, and he wrote in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, he says in his in his client letter here, he says natural gas for the most purposes like home heating and electric utility plants is a better and cleaner fuel than oil or coal, but is for technical reasons in distress. There have been several recent decades in which the BTU equivalent price for natural gas did at least for a second reach parity with oil but now it is just 14% of the BTU equivalency, the lowest in almost 50 years. Everyone who has a brain should be thinking of how to make money on this in the longer term. And we certainly agree with Mr. Grantham on this point. We would speculate that Michael Smith also agrees with us as evidenced by his uh, recent offer for Compton. And we expect to do very, very well if this closes. So, let's move on to slide number 25 and I want to touch on the risks. It would be imprudent of us ever to give a presentation like this without touching on the risk slide. Ultimately, we have to address each of these and get comfortable with the fact that uh, the companies that we're doing business with have, have addressed these or are positioned to prosper in light of these. So with MFC, we have a company in the base metals industry. Base metals are susceptible to recession risks. So that could be driven by European fears or uh, other uh, parts of our economy like the fiscal cliff. There are commodities business and commodities can be particularly vulnerable in that environment. There are other business specific risks related to miners such as uh, mine flood, fire, weather related ray, uh, delays, equipment risks as we already mentioned. And then we have commodities risks associated with merchant banking activities such as speculative positions, counterparty risks, and credit risks. So let's move on to slide number 26 for a quick conclusion. We have MFC priced very cheaply with a good dividend yield, 3.1%. Great management team, some recession risk, but that actually might work out in our favor if it presented Michael Smith and the opportunity to, to um, put more of the cash to work and some distressed companies that would naturally result in that type of environment. And we have uh, solid book value with good cash on the balance sheet and a guaranteed payment from that royalty stream that all provides some downside protection. So all in all, we're very excited about MFC. Uh, we hope that you are too. We always end our presentations with a call to action, and that's really just um, some encouragement on our part to anybody that's watching this video to reach out and engage with us and ask us questions about MFC. We will do another event in our offices next month. That's uh, September 13th at 7.30 a.m., so feel free to join us. We always get an engaging conversation uh, at our meetings. Um, make an appointment with us if you want to find out more about what we do. We'd love to sit down and talk to you more about your own personal portfolio. Um, and then lastly, if you've heard something that you like, forward this on to a friend, uh, get them involved. Uh, the more opinions we have, the more information we have, the better our, uh, we are at what we do. So we want, we want all the information that we can get on any company we do business with. If you have an aunt or uncle or niece or nephew that works for MFC or has done business with them, then we want to talk to them. Uh, lastly, 
Uh, we're involved in a monthly investors club. This is uh, not something that uh, uh, Cush Capital hosts, but it is something that uh, we host. We, we host it in our office, but it's not a part of our firm. So if that's something you, you, that you're interested in and you want to engage in a conversation um, like this, but in a more roundtable format, then let us know and we'll get you involved. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next month.